Okay, it's about three minutes after, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as I was saying, this is part two of a two-part mini-series. Um, last week, my colleague Eric Millman talked about the risk metric package, and today we're going to be talking about the risk assessment application. Um, so my name is Aaron Clark. If you don't know me, um, I work at Biogen as a data scientist, and I serve as the lead developer for the risk assessment application uh, for the R Validation Hub. Okay, so a quick disclaimer, any of my opinions that I express here today don't necessarily reflect those of Biogen or the R Validation Hub. And this is a quick agenda of what we plan to discuss. So just a quick intro to both risk metric and risk assessment. In the past, I've given other talks that kind of delve deeper into, you know, risk assessment, you know, how to install it and for the first time and things like that. Uh, this talk, we're going to assume you kind of already have a general sense of that, um, but we will talk about, you know, the importance of why we created this shiny app in the first place. Uh, I would say the bread and butter of the talk is going to be, you know, hovering around the latest enhancements with a, a recent release uh, that just came out earlier this week. And, and then we have to do a demo, of course, to show you hands on, you know, how these new enhancements look and feel in the app. I have a couple of things to tease in a coming soon segment, and then we'll finish with some Q&A. So if you're not familiar already, uh, the R Validation Hub has been around for a while, and it's just basically just a group of pharma organizations that are all focused on building you know, unique tools to uh, help those who work in a, a regulatory environments. Um, so if you're, if you're unfamiliar, go check out the pharmar.org website, and there's lots of info there about all the work streams that exist within the R Validation Hub, and there's plenty of opportunities to get plugged in if it's something that you're interested in doing. Okay, so the two tools that we're focusing on for this mini-series is uh, first and foremost, Risk Metric, um, which uh, we talked about in part one of the mini-series. So it's a framework to quantify risk of using an R package in a regulatory environment. Um, and that risk is quantitative, you know, something that has been converted into sort of a number. Um, and then the risk assessment uh, package is a full-fledged R package, but it is also a shiny application that sits on top of risk metric. The main goal of that package being, uh, we'll get into all the details of it here shortly, but uh, basically to be a central hub for your organization to be able to sort of use risk metric in a meaningful way. So just to recap, uh, risk metric uh, is a means by which to assess quality of a piece of software. Um, and it does that by leveraging a number of assessments. So to date, there's about 18 assessments, uh, give or take. And they're all geared towards like measuring, you know, software dev best practices, <clears throat> community engagement, um, sustainability, things like that. So here's just a sampling of a few of the assessments. <clears throat> like does the package have a license? Does it have a place to report bugs? Um, and it can get into to more uh, complex things like, you know, how is the test coverage for this uh, application or, or a function and uh, community usage like reverse dependencies, you know, do other packages rely on this package or how often is it uh, downloaded, how popular is it, things like that. So why create a Shiny app? Uh, the, the Shiny app was actually created a while ago, probably three-ish years ago. And I think the main goal of the app, or at least its highest and best use, is to help organizations, and specifically uh, people within organizations, sort of create the documentation necessary uh, for uh, GXP package inclusion. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, that means that we're trying to provide a means or a highway for members of an org to take responsibility for assessing a package's risk before they go and make a request to their IT personnel or maybe their whoever the gatekeeper is that makes those package inclusion decisions um, so that the onus isn't on them. It's, it's really on the requester, the person who is making the request. And so the way that we do this is we, we our summation or the reason the app exists is to create you know, a beautiful like summary report that goes through all the different points uh, that maybe and all the requirements uh, that your organization needs before it can 
you know, include a package in a regulatory like uh, development environment. So that's the goal. So we're trying to uh, make users create these reports that they can then hand off to the person making those those decisions. And so we're trying to avoid, you know, just people asking those people directly saying, hey, I want, you know, these 10 packages uh, because I need to do an analysis that requires these 10 packages. So this actually makes the person reflect upon uh, the Shiny app helps people reflect upon the risk of using and introducing those packages to a GXP environment. So along the way, uh, it does a lot of other things. So in order to achieve that goal, so it, it provides uh, one space where you can do tons of package exploration without the need to write any custom code, uh, especially custom risk, met risk metric code. Along those same lines, um, it's going to ensure that the risk metric code you are running is ran on the same machine and in the same environment. So that's going to help with reproducibility of the different risk outputs that we can generate with risk metric. In addition, um, it's going to make sure that you're following your uh, org specific settings. So you may have like a lot of options that are specific to your organization. Um, and so by using the application, there's ways um, that we'll talk about in a little in a little bit that sort of help us do that well and do that consistently. Um, it also does do some automation for you. So it's so when you first start using the app, like it, it won't be an art uh, a terribly arduous process to start, um, you know, categorizing, you know, packages as either, you know, low, high, or, or medium risk or something like that. Um, there is some automation that's built into the app and we have plans to build in more in the future. Um, it allows you to manage who's involved in the process. So um, there are different people that you may want to perform some part of the review, like maybe um, a statistical procedure could be reviewed by a certain person. Um, and there could be another person who assesses a different aspect of a package. So uh, we've built in lots of authentication and role management um, features to allow uh, admin users to do that. Uh, in addition, we can store lots of summaries and communication. So as you're reviewing these packages, you can take notes. Um, you can write down things you think are important or not important. You can comment and ask you know, someone else to um, check out something that you found interesting. And we're going to store all those, all that communication and all that summary in the uh, the database that sits um, inside of the application, um, so that it can be published in the in the final report if you want it to. And then, last but not least, of course, we have the the summary report, and that's going to be shared with the decision makers, right? Okay, so that is the reason why um, this app exists. Um, it really is, I think, a great add to Risk Metric. And I think it helps organizations really adopt uh, risk metric a lot better for, for the reasons mentioned. Okay, so the bread and butter of today's talk is I really want to share some of the latest features of the application um, that came out in version 2.0.0. So this just hit GitHub um, you know, earlier this week. And so I'm excited to share with you all the things that it includes. So there's a facelift to the report builder and the database view. Uh, there's better support to analyze dependencies in the application. So that's that's pretty exciting news. I'll show you what that means in a little bit. Um, there's even more org level customization, including the use of a configuration file. So we'll show you an example config file uh, as well. Um, we now allow admin users to edit roles and privileges, first and foremost in that configuration file, but also on the fly in the application. And the sort of the climax of today's talk is we allow users to explore source contents of a package. So this is a new feature uh, where uh, it kind of deviates from just following, you know, risk metric to a T. So it, it's basically the application now serves up lots of risk metric info, but it also allows for a, very, uh, a more manual hands-on approach to exploring a package. And you'll see that uh, in just a minute. So I just want to mention uh, before I show you know a demo and all these examples that um, the reason that we were able to sort of work on and, uh, and focus our efforts on these features, these new features, is because um, you know people told us that they're important in our uh, our issues uh, GitHub page. So if you think that there's an issue that you'd like to open so that we can focus our efforts on something that's important to 
your organization, uh, please let us know. Open up a GitHub uh, issue and we would love to talk about it with you. Okay, so first and foremost, the report builder. So previously, I don't think we even called this a report builder. I think we just called it a, a report preview, um, but it's it's definitely a more holistic approach now. We allow users to define what content shows up in the report. And we also added a package summary. So if I scroll down here, there's a little GIF showing off, you know, what the report kind of looks like today, all the metrics that you can see, all the comments and summaries, and even a little metadata in the report. But now let's say you want to get rid of like the author on the report, you can remove that. If you want to get rid of this overall comments, uh, you can remove that piece as well. So it provides for a lot more customization in that way. There's also this new package summary where you can write really important information. Maybe you want to hit, you know, these six points or seven or eight or 15 points that you need to make sure you hit before that before you deliver uh, this summary to someone. Uh, for package inclusion reasons, and then you can download it in whatever format that you want. So I think the options are HTML, uh, uh, Word file, or a PDF at this point. So that's kind of the, the facelift that the, the report builder got, and we have some more plans uh, to keep expanding this out in the future, but this is kind of our first step in that direction. Um, so it's definitely become more usable from that, as that aspect. Okay, so the database viewer also got a facelift. And if you don't remember what the database viewer is, it basically shows you like all the uploaded packages um, that you have um, uploaded to the application in the past. So we, first and foremost, you're gonna get a summary of the uploaded packages. You're gonna see the date that the package was uploaded. Um, that's become increasingly important because it's that date is tied to when your risk metric code was run and thus when your package was accessed assessed um, and also a bunch of decision related columns so i'll show you those in just a minute and now everything is like really easily downloadable um, which is pretty low hanging fruit uh, from a table perspective here so here up at the top you can see this is just a preview you can see you know i have 300 packages in my database 178 of them had a decision made about them. And then you get, even get a little summary where it says, you know, one package was considered low risk, 147 was medium risk, and 30 were high risk. Um, so you can see that uh, right here is our decision column, and you can see who made the decision. So sometimes it's made by a specific user. Uh, but if you used any of our decision automation, you can see that a lot of these were auto assigned up when they were uploaded to the database. And so I didn't have to do any extra work um, to assign those. Um, you can see that date uploaded is listed here as well. And also the decision date is included as well. And I can't remember if this was in our last release or not, but uh, we also have buttons here. So if you wanna quickly zip over to view the zoo package or something, you can click this button and view all the metrics related for that package. So just quick, uh, quick and easy, like back and forth to view packages that you desire. Okay, so that's the database view facelift. Um, ran through that pretty quickly, but we'll explore a little more later. Uh, package dependencies now ha has um, additional support in the application. So here I'm looking at the caret package and you can see that it has a lot of dependencies. Uh, it says 16 here. But if you uh, look at each one, you can see that a lot of these are just base R um, at the bottom here. So I wouldn't say those should really count against you know a package. Most people trust uh, base R packages. Um, you can see that some of them have package scores listed here, and they range from 0.27 to 0.6. And then there's a couple of them here, two packages that aren't in our database. And so we've created some handy little buttons where you can automatically just click those and it'll upload and it'll produce a score for you. Um, but this is handy because it shows you a, a lot of people um, that we've learned through our case studies uh, really care about those first order dependencies because a, a package is only as good as the packages that it's built on. So uh, this may be worth exploring further for the carrot package, like if you wanna explore this package, these two or three packages that kind of have high scores. In addition, you can see reverse dependencies really clearly. So this uh, uh, 293 packages depend on uh, the care package. So that is, uh, I would say, a high amount, a high number of packages. Um, so that only uh, uh, 
shows how reliable you know this code base must be because it is uh, so many people rely on it for um, building their packages. Okay, so another great add to the app is um, ability to tweak org level settings and uh, you can do this either in app or in the configuration file. So you can customize your decision categories and even the colors that go with the decision categories in case you wanted to make something that's, you know, maybe consistent with your organization's color scheme, uh, corporate color scheme. Um, you can toggle your automation rules. Uh, you can mess with the roles and privileges, and you can also initialize your metric weights um, in the app or in the config file. So here's an example configuration file. Um, uh, you can specify all your databases, the names and the locations of your database. That's been there for a while, um, but the credentials uh, is a new portion. So here you can specify your roles. So here we have an admin, a lead, a reviewer, and a viewer role. You can put whatever you want here. And then you can specify you know, what privileges each role should have. So the admin role in this scenario has all the, all the privileges. It can do, the admin user can do anything. They can uh, change and edit um, existing users. They can adjust weights. They can make final decisions. They can revert decisions. You can add and delete packages, add overall comments, et cetera. Uh, a reviewer, uh, conversely, can only add packages or make general comments. Um, so they have way fewer privileges. And you can see that a viewer actually has less privileges yet. They can't do anything. All they can do is sort of log in and kind of look around at things, which may be you know, a role that you want to assign to certain people groups. Uh, the decisions uh, um, piece in the YAML file, this allows you to specify a few things. So you can specify the names of the categories, the rules associated with those categories, and the colors. So uh, here we have the typical three low, medium, high risk. But you could have two if you want. You could have you know, GXP compliant or not GXP compliant, something like that. Or you can have five categories, uh, whatever your organization you know, wants to use, you could do that. And if you want to take advantage of some automation rules, you can specify those here. So here you can see I made a rule for medium risk and one for high risk. So basically this is saying whenever uh, a package um, score, a risk metric score, is over 0.639 and less than one, then it should be automatically categorized as high risk. Uh, and then you could do that uh, for as many of the categories as you want or as few as you want. So here you can see I'm not doing it for low risk. So that means there's no rules associated with low risk. Nothing will be automatically categorized in that case. And then if you want, you can add a color. So here we're adding, adding a, we're using RGB to generate a color for us. Um, and just for medium risk. Um, lastly, you can actually initialize your metric weights directly from the config file. Um, you can also adjust them in the app, but it is nice to be able to just set these here in the config file uh, on the onset um, so that at, with future deployments, you know, everything is already set up for you. So here you can see um, there's only two listed. So all the metrics are going to receive an equal weight of one unless you change it here. So you can give it either a zero um, for here for code coverage. So basically I'm saying, hey, get rid of code coverage. It's not important to me for some reason. I would argue that, you know, that is a really important one. So it probably shouldn't be a zero. Um, or uh, vignettes. Vignettes are really important to me, so I'm going to bump that up to a two. And so just to show you, you can change these things on the fly in the app. So uh, this is for setting your, your uh, automated decisions. And then you can see, which we already saw earlier, is, is when you upload a package, it's going to be automatically assigned. And you can see that here um, in, the, in the database view. Okay, so that's a quick a highlight of all the org level settings that we've empowered our users or at least our app deployers um, to use or our admin users to use. Um, and just a little bit more on the roles and privileges. So we, you've always, admin users have always been able to add new users and sort of uh, edit user profiles. So here's an example where we have um, Adam, the admin, Lenny, the lead, Rachel, the reviewer, and Vu, the viewer. So those are the people who are uh, authenticated to use our application. 
And you can see here's a definition of the privileges that each one of those roles have. So it's exactly the same as, as what we covered before. Um, but what's neat now is you can actually adjust these things on the fly. So for example, uh, I can say maybe I don't want you know my uh, lead uh, role to be able to adjust weights anymore. So I could uncheck this checkbox. And you can see I created a new role over here um, also on the fly saying, hey, I wanna create a new role that can make final decisions and make general comments. And that's all I want them to be able to do. Um, so that's a really nice handy feature to have in the application. Okay, so this is this is probably the most exciting part of uh, all of our latest enhancements, and that is that we've added a file browser. Um, so uh, like I said previously, risk metric, we've basically stuck to risk metric up until this point, but now we're adding in the concept of sort of a more manual package review um, we're uh, essentially starting off with a file browser. So you can, we're actually downloading the tarball so you can explore the source contents of any package that you want. So here I have a package tidy C disk. Um, you can see all the authors here. You can see a great description. You can see the license, the URL, the bug reports URL, everything is listed here. Super easy to navigate. Um, just as if you were a developer, you know, on this project and, and scrolling through the, the files. Um, down here, uh, I just am showcasing that if you want to read through like some of the tests to see how robust the tests are looking, um, you can do that and you can sort of make some decisions and write down some comments on how you feel their tests are written. So this is a really handy feature and um, we, we have a lots of plans to expand this even more and I'll share that uh, in a little bit as well. Okay, so those are our latest features, a recap of all the features. Lots of activity has been happening in the repo. And so, uh, like I said, please open some GitHub issues if you wanna see some change uh, personally, or uh, reach out to us on GitHub or reach out uh, on Slack or in the chat or something if you wanna get involved in this project because we can always use uh, more hands, more developers to uh, keep the effort going. Okay, so I thought I'd take a break um, from the slides and just switch over to a chat and, uh, I'm sorry, switch over to uh, the application to show off like how it looks today now that we have all these new features in there. Um, and we'll review a, a package called Prodlim. Um, so first when you come over, uh, oh, I also, if you guys wanna follow along, let me put this in the chat. Send to everyone, send. Okay, so I just sent you a link if you wanna kind of follow along with the demo. Um, basically it's it's available right now. It's hosted on shinyapps.io and it's a, a version of the application that is pre-populated with about 300 packages. It has the Pharmaverse uploaded, uh, the Tidyverse uploaded, and I think about 250 other packages that are uh, highly popular packages. So they have like the most downloads um, uh, out of all of CRAN. So uh, the first screen you're gonna be, come to is our authentication screen. And you're gonna see you know, what version of the app you're working with. This is uh, the latest one, 2.0.0. And then there's some instructions down here if you want to log in as a certain type of user. So the, there's an admin user, a lead user, and a reviewer, um, each with a username and the password is available right there. So I'm gonna log in as an admin user and that'll redirect me to the application. And so uh, the application, uh, depending on the last time you've seen it, uh, looks more or less the same. Um, there's a big control panel on the left-hand side, and this is where you can select, you know, a package from the database that you've previously uploaded. If you haven't uploaded something yet, um, feel free to just type in the name of the package here. You can upload as many packages as you want. And this list is actually pulling all the packages from CRAN. Um, so you have access to them all right there. So you can type in you know, anything that you want. You also have the power to delete packages if you want, or if you wanna upload like a large swath of packages, maybe you have like 500 packages you wanna upload, you can browse for a CSV on your computer. It just has to be in this format where the package is given and the version is given. 
Um, oh yeah, so before I start looking at prod limb, this is where you can sort of adjust your decisions on the fly, your automated decisions. So for example, if you want medium risk to be from 0.3 to 0.64, and you actually do want low risk to be categorized, you can add low risk in here. Or maybe you just wanna do high risk, uh, that's a possibility. Uh, but you can also, like I said, change the colors to be something else if you're not satisfied with the colors, so. But I'm just gonna leave those as is for now. And I said I wanted to look up a package called prodlim. So I, I have never used prodlim before. Um, I just thought it would be a good example for us to look at. Um, if I go over to the build report tab, actually, it'll tell us what it does. So it says it's a fast and user-friendly implementation of non-parametric estimators for censored event history. So Kappenmeyer and things like that. Um, so if I go, so usually you're on the upload packages, head over to package metrics, and this is gonna be where you see most of your risk metric metrics. And so I intentionally chose this one because its risk score is rather high. Um, so you can see here that it's at a 0.81. And so if you don't know your risk score is 0.81, that's a pretty high risk score. Um, and you can see why. So if you look at these metrics, uh, it's missing vignettes, missing a news file, um, doesn't have a URL to report bugs, uh, couldn't find a website or source control. So it's missing quite a bit. It's, it's a lot. Um, so the only thing it does have is we do have a maintainer and we have dependencies and we have a license. Um, so if I'm reviewing this package, if I put myself in those shoes, um, I want to just make note of that probably because I'll want that to show up in the final report. So you can see there's some comments down here already, um, but I'm just going to go ahead and add a fresh comment that says uh, missing quite a bit of uh, metric info. Uh, we do, however, have a license uh, and dependencies on file. So I'll get, we'll give them credit for that. And then you can see that the, the comment shows up directly beneath, um, beneath that. So heading over to community usage metrics, um, we can note uh, quite a bit here. So first we can see that this package has existed for a long time, 15 years. Um, and it looks like the latest release was pushed four months ago. So that's good news. It tells me that you know both that this package is probably pretty mature existing for so long. And it's still in development because it's been, um, you know, put, a new release has been pushed in recent history. I can also see that this package is very, very popular. So there's 1.3 million downloads in the last 12 months. Um, uh, a few packages rely on it. And I would say th 39 is pretty high. Um, I, I wish I had 39 packages relying on the packages I, I build. Um, but if you look here, it looks like even though it's existed for 15 years, it's had zero downloads on CRAN until about 2008-ish or something like that. So this is a fun little graphic and we can kind of zoom in on the time period that we're interested in. But this is the number of downloads per month uh, since, since inception of the package. So you can see that it really got its first bump in like 2017 where it had 50,000 downloads in a month. And it's been kind of trending upwards ever since then to probably a climax in November 2021 where I had 350,000 downloads. So it's quite a bit. Um, I'm not super worried about this downward trend because it looks like it's highly influenced by, you know, this bump uh, that it had um, in 2021. Um, I would, if I had to fit a line to it without that bump, I'd say it's probably, you know, trending slightly upward even. So so taking in all that information, maybe I just want to make a few comments uh, saying, hey, this, this package is really popular. Popular at 1.3, whoops, 1.3 million uh, downloads. And maybe I'll just say in one year. Uh, it's still actively developed. Um, uh, almost 40 packages rely on it. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I wanted to say about uh, from a community usage perspective. So I think that the, the community usage looks really great. I think this bodes well for the package. 
So taking it a step further, this is the new package dependencies um, page that we added. So uh, this is nice because it gives us sort of a firsthand look at you know, uh, the footprint, the dependency footprint of a package. So we did get the metric on page one, uh, sorry, page one, maintenance metric. It said there's 10. Um, but now we're kind of just zooming in on that to see, you know, what 10 are we talking about? Um, and it looks like three of those are actually just base R packages. And then uh, some of them appear to be slightly riskier. So maybe we want to investigate the diagram package or something like that. Um, but in general, uh, it looks okay um, in terms of it's not relying on too many packages. Um, there are two packages that we haven't uploaded yet. So if we wanted to, we could click this button, these buttons to upload each one of those. And then if you wanted to see the reverse dependencies, uh, all the packages that exist, you could do that here. So it looks like uh, censored relies on it and even parsnip relies on it, which is I think a tidyverse package. Um, so that's probably why or where it got its boost in uh, popularity is when maybe when Parsnip started using it, but I haven't confirmed that, so. Okay, so that rounds out sort of our metrics. Um, now I thought we could just take a minute and explore the package um, via the Source Explorer. So this is our file browser that's literally like um, downloading the tarball and untarring it so that you can browse the contents of the package. And uh, the first thing that you're gonna notice is that this, this tr file tree browser is pretty, pretty bare bones. Um, there's not much here. I mean, you have what you need to, to make a package, um, but there, there isn't a whole lot. So the, the description file is pretty bare. Um, you know, it just has the, the bare minimum. Looks like there's just one, one author. I don't see any other contributors, which may be a risk for you. I don't know if, if they're for your organization, if you like to see more authors. Um, and then it looks like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of R files. So you know, let me scroll down just a little bit. Um, there's probably like forty, if I had to guess, maybe forty or fifty uh, R files here. So that tells me that there's like just a lot of helper functions um, used to sort of support the the exported functions for this package. Um, and so likewise, I would expect, um, you know, to see a lot of tests, right, if there's high test coverage. But it looks like there is just about three, um, you know, test files for this package. Um, so that doesn't, that doesn't bode well from a testing perspective. Um, so maybe that's something I'd want to make a comment on. So um, test coverage uh, appears to be, to be lacking with three test files and about 40-ish um, R functions uh, in the R folder. So I think that's worth noting. And so that comment goes down there as well. Um, so that's, that's sort of all we have to offer so far in terms of exploring. Um, so now we can head over to the build report um, tab. And so this is where we can kind of finalize things. Like what do we actually want to include in the report before we send it on to, um, you know, the person making the package inclusion decisions. So here you can see all of our maintenance metrics are included, all of our comments, all of our community usage metrics. We even have this plot here, which you can, of course, adjust to whatever time frame that you want. If you just want to show the last two years, you could do that, um, or the last one year, whatever is important to you. And then, as I mentioned before, there's a metadata portion to this report. So here we have the version of the app, the version of risk metric, the date and time it was generated, and also um, just a quick recap of the metric weights. So here you can see we're only prioritizing vignettes to be slightly higher. So we give it, for some reason, you know, vignettes are important to us. So we uh, weighted that a little bit higher. So uh, like before, I'll probably get rid of the report author and um, overall score. Uh, if I want to make changes to this package summary, like I said, this is where you're going to want to like add the stuff that's that's really important to you, you know, requirements, you know, uh, number, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can you can add that uh, all the pieces of information that you need and it'll show up down here in your report. So I'll just download that as HTML. And that takes just a minute and then it'll be ready to send. So just to give you a quick preview, 
that's what it looks like. This is what I want to send to the person who needs to know about uh, this package uh, for your package inclusion request for GXP environment. So that's what it looks like. I'll close that down. And then basically my, you know, my job is done for now for uh, this package. If you wanted to review like all the packages in the database, um, that is at the database tab up here. And we kind of already went over this, but, and you can zip over to any package that you want um, just by clicking these buttons. Okay. So that's, I think that's all I really had to share. Oh, I guess real quickly, this is where your admin tools are located. So uh, you can add and edit users. Um, you can assign and adjust privileges here, roles and privileges um, for who is using the app. And then you can also uh, adjust your weight. So if you really wanna up the ante on your vignettes, you can crank that weight way up um, or, or adjust it down, whatever you want. And then you can also back up your database if you want to download a copy that's accessible to you as well. Okay, so with that said, that's kind of the, the premise of the demo. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, talk about a few things that are coming soon, and then we'll we'll talk about, uh, we'll share some Q&A, time of Q&A. So uh, Eric mentioned this uh, in part one of the mini series, but Risk Score is a, a fun new initiative that is kickstarting and complements the risk metric package really well. Um, it'll help um, lots of folks uh, be able to, uh, you know, see how risk scores are trending over time. I think that would be helpful for the application, and I think it'll be helpful for the developers of Risk Metric too to see like. You know, as different versions of risk metric come out, how our scores impacted. Um, so I'm really excited to see that kind of get off the ground. And, and we're loosely planning on shooting for um, the October timeframe to, to get that um, repo uh, uh, more robust. Um, right now it's in an experimental state, um, but it does have some initial, like uh, an initial data set that has scores for all of CRAN, which is about 20,000 or so packages. So that's something excited to look forward to. Um, and yeah, this is just a distribution of different groups and their risk scores. So here's like the tidyverse has like this pristine, you know, record of having really low um, risk scores. And then the pharmaverse is actually not too far behind. So that, that looks good, uh, but they do have a slight tail off to the right. And then here's a number of other uh, groups of packages based off of popularity. So the top 100 downloads the top 100 to 500 and so on. And then this is the other thing that I'm really excited to announce is we're gonna to continue to build out our package explorer. Uh, thanks to our friends at GSK for um, sharing their code with us. Um, they built a really cool shiny app um, a couple of years ago that actually helps assess um, any exported function from a package. It will, um, digest three things. So you can see the test code. So right now we're displaying test code. And every time that that function is being called in a, a test file, you can explore the source code and you can also explore the documentation all in one easy to use like user interface. Um, so that's the direction we're gonna be heading and going uh, for the future. And so I just wanted to sort of tease that now um, because it's something exciting to look forward to. Okay, so this is our dev team. Uh, the app wouldn't be where it is today without all these members uh, contributing in one way or another. So a huge thanks, huge shout out to them and all their contributions um, in the last several years. And then that's all I have for you. So I, I have a, I'd be happy to answer any questions um, that may uh, have popped up while I was going through that, um, talking about the latest enhancements or going through the demo or whatever. Uh, but I have some links here for you. So um, if you're interested, um, I can share these. Yeah, I can actually just paste these right here. I think I already shared the demo one. Um, but if you wanna reach out um, on GitHub, here's that link. And if you wanna reach out, we put together uh, a Google form for a survey. So this basically just helps us understand how you're using risk metric or risk assessment. So we'd love to hear from you on that. And it looks like I need to include the HTTPS. 
And then, of course, pharmar.org is, is really helpful if you want to get involved um, or reach out and join an existing work stream. And you can join, you know, risk metric, risk assessment, or you can even join other work streams that exist in the R Validation Hub. So with that, yeah, is there any questions? Be happy to talk if you want to take yourself off mute or if you just want to submit your question in the chat, um, either works great for me. Hi, Aaron. Um, so I had one question on the demo we you showed. Um, how much of that is like admin specific and like our reviewers, our viewers, like who would um, with the package um, kind of assessment you were going through, who would be able to see all those features? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I, as an admin, you obviously have like all rights, all privileges mm -hmm. to look mm -hmm. at everything that you want. And I would direct your attention to this roles and privileges tab. So this is under admin tools, roles and privileges. And that will actually show you who has what right. So admin can do everything, a lead, can do everything except for, um, and these are just, you know, these are defaults that we built into the app, but mm -hmm. you can customize these roles to do whatever you want. So um, you can take, I mean, you can take these as is, um, but really you can do whatever. So this, a lead can adjust the metric weights. They can adjust the automated decision-making. So like if you upload a package, if the score is really high, it'll automatically, you know, Put the label on it that this is a high risk package um, this person can make final decisions they can revert final decisions they can add new packages they can delete packages and then they can make overall comments and general comments and then similarly for a reviewer they can only add packages and make general comments so that's kind of the way we've set it up um, but obviously yeah like i said you can you can set it up however your organization wants to, but in general, these are all the privileges that exist um, to date. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. This is a good question. Okay. Oh yeah, so someone asked, what is test coverage? Why not actually calculate code coverage? So uh, I, I, was, I guess I was using those words uh, interchangeably. Um, so code coverage or test coverage is, is something that risk metric will um, calculate for you, um, but not it's not going to uh, render on this demo app. And that's because we are seeking out what's called the CRAN remote um, source for the package. So if you have you know, the source for any given package, like the source code, um, you can actually, risk metric will calculate this for you. But since we are, you know, this is just an uh, meant to be a lightweight application um, that we just want to grab information from the CRAN remote source. And so there's a few metrics um, that actually can't be calculated because of that. And actually, I was talking with um, some of our developers this morning on that. And I think we'll probably start to tailor the app a little bit more, like whenever there isn't a metric that's available for a given source, um, you know, we probably won't show it anymore. So for example, test coverage, this uh, card here probably shouldn't show up. But the good news is, is this, this uh, being not found, it's not gonna hurt your score. Um, it only, uh, only um, assessments that exist can actually impact your score. Um, so this test coverage is not going to impact it. It's like a good question. Okay, cool. Thank you, Eric, for following up on that. Um, yeah, does anyone else have a question per se? So I don't have a question. I have one thought, and maybe I can add this as an issue on the GitHub. Um, but in your Source Explorer, um, maybe add like a loader, like, you know, they have the shiny CSS loader because it took mm -hmm. a second for it to load. And for me, I would have thought something was wrong and tried to reload the page. So, oh, okay. Just... Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. The way that we're doing it is there, there's a bunch of, you know, so we have 300, 300 packages uploaded in our database and, um, 
it's got to go find the tarball and start to, to populate this area. So yeah, I think that we actually have some things in mind to improve speed a little bit, but you're right. If, if there is like a little wait, um, yeah, we should definitely show the user that, hey, everything's working. Uh, just wait a minute and, and then we'll show you something cool. <laughs> Please avoid the rage refresh. <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, if you want to open a GitHub issue, I love that because I love it when um, uh, uh, other people are opening GitHub issues and not just me, so. Sure, I'll put that in for you. <laughs> thank you. Um, cool, let's see. Okay, so yeah, someone in the chat asks, uh, what about RCMD check? Any plans to include results from it? It says, in my opinion, the RCMD check and code coverage are the most important metrics. Yeah, so I think RCMD check also has some problems with um, Crane Remote. I guess, Eric, maybe you can confirm that for me. Um, so yeah, it, so the actual running of <clears throat> our command check happens for source packages, um, but not for remotes, though that will be coming, I think, as we nest different source types. Um, but there is a metric for CRAN remotes where we scrape the results of CRAN's R command checks on their test servers. Oh, um, okay. Now, so it is important. However, if you have errors or warnings when you submit to CRAN, you eventually, you either don't make it to CRAN or you get rebooted from CRAN if you don't resolve them quickly enough. So for, for so if you're using the CRAN remote object, in fact, the CRAN, the CRAN command check results are not that informative because they pass on the test systems 95% yeah. like of the time. Right. Um, and then second to our command check is, it is a good one, however, it, kind of starts to violate the, the sort of the in, initial spirit of risk metric, which is assessing a package sort of in, a, in an isolated environment because our command check requires all the dependencies possibly suggest. And so that pushes it out of that sort of narrowly defined scope, but is on our radar in terms of either assessing cohorts or environments, you know, that have sort of all your packages may be in one place. Um, but we do run it for a source package uh, or can run it uh, for a source package for sure. Okay. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, the only thing that you would be able to have visibility to with a crane remote is just notes, right? Because you can you can have notes um, on, while you're on crane, but otherwise, yeah, they'll, they'll have a problem with any warnings or errors, so. Yeah, and even notes, I think they can have, they'll have sometimes have problems with because yeah. Brand is notoriously picky, we'll say, um, sometimes with their submission criteria. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and Eric alluded to this a little bit, but there there may be a time in the near future when um, uh, risk metric will automatically sort of be nesting or chaining the different source types. So, um, and I forgot to mention this um, when I was reviewing test coverage. Um, for now, we may take this card out if it's not available, but in the future, risk metric may be able to pull it um, uh, automatically for us. And that way, uh, we'll have more complete uh, view of what's happening um, in this maintenance metrics landscape. So that was also mentioned uh, last week at, uh, during part one of the series. Cool. All right. Well, any more questions or comments or suggestions? Uh, is this like tied to a specific version of R? Because sometimes, you know, packages will not be available for a given version. So, or is this just like R version agnostic? Yeah. So um, you can run the, app, the application. Um, you know, if you, and there's instructions on our GitHub, um, let me just pull those up real quick and slide it over here. 
So this is our GitHub page and there is um, some installation instructions here. And so we are using, I'm uh, sorry, let me scroll down to the right spot. Yeah, installation. We are using RM um, to sort of control the version of R that we're working with for development purposes. And we would propose, you know, that's probably something that you should also do within your organization to sort of fix on a specific version of R. But um, you can uh, you can run on the latest version, uh, but we would just you know highly recommend being intentional about which one you choose. And so we found RM is a, a good way to do that. Um, so yeah, the demo app is using a certain version, probably R four four point two point two, I think, um, uh, right now. So yeah, if I had to guess, that's what that's the one it's using. Yeah, there's more there's more context here in this installation um, section. So I'll just paste this in the chat too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions, comments, suggestions? Okay, hearing none, uh, I will give you six minutes back. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the R Validation Hub certainly appreciates uh, your interest. And like I said, if you have any more comments, uh, reach out to us on GitHub um, and we'd be glad to, to keep the conversation going. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Thank See you. you. Later. Thank you.